All right. Well, thank you everyone again for joining. My name is Catherine Lyons. I'm the manager of policy and coalitions for the Economic Innovation Group. Um, really appreciate you joining us today uh, for this webinar on the COVID-19 comeback, how policies to support new business creation can help drive recovery. I just wanted to start with a couple of notes at the top here. Uh, first is that we are recording this webinar. Uh, and you will receive a uh, recording uh, as well as a blog post recapping this discussion uh, within about a week's time. Um, so please note, you will uh, receive this recording um, and, we, uh, and that will be in your inbox uh, shortly. Additionally, we welcome um, input and Q&A uh, throughout the webinar and the presentation. Um, if you could use the Q&A box, um, that will best allow us to make sure we don't miss your question. Um, and after uh, the conversation with Senator Amy Klobuchar and our panel discussion, we will get to as many of those questions as possible uh, during the last few minutes um, of this presentation. So with, with that uh, behind us, uh, I'll say that, that, so our Vice President, uh, Chris Levin, uh, who will be moderating today's discussion as well, uh, had the opportunity to speak with Senator Amy Klobuchar uh, earlier this week on the New Business Preservation Act, which is legislation that she sponsored uh, and introduced earlier this year, um, as well as just entrepreneurship generally and how uh, policies can support particularly minority and women-owned businesses um, who are starting up. Um, and so we want to uh, first start with that conversation. Um, and so I will start this video now uh, before moving into the panel discussion um, of our presentation. Senator Klobuchar, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to say hi to all our entrepreneurs out there, especially um, our Minnesota ones. I know it's not an easy time um, to be making it and the fact that uh, you're still doing it and that you believe that we're going to get through this, that I thoroughly do, um, and that we can have a better year next year. Um, I want to thank you for doing that. It's so important. Thanks, Senator. So this, this conversation we're having is sort of the preamble for a panel uh, discussion that EIG is hosting with a group of entrepreneurs, including uh, the CEO of a great Minnesota business, Connect IQ. Uh, about the importance of uh, new business creation in the COVID economic uh, recovery. And you have legislation, uh, the New Business Preservation Act, that would, uh, if enacted, provide a big boost to entrepreneurs. And so can you tell us a little bit about it and what led you to introduce the legislation? Sure. Well, this really comes out of uh, even pre-COVID, we were working on this because um, you've seen this startup slump in our uh, country in the last few years. And I think we all know that it's been these startups that have driven so many of the small and big companies and so many of the much of job creation in our country. And more than ever now, especially with the pandemic where we've seen COVID uh, expected to, and actually as we speak, disproportionately harming new businesses because I mean, they have less cash on hand, uh, the drop off, they have thinner margins and they don't have the cash build up like a bunch of um, our great big companies in Minnesota, but it's just not the same. And so um, more than ever, as we look at what I call the day after tomorrow, which is how we're going to get through this, um, it's going to be a lot about how do we get that uh, entrepreneurial economy going again? How do we promote entrepreneurship? So what the bill does is it allows Treasury to partner with states. It's kind of complicated because you can't do it. The money can't go just directly from Treasury because of various legal issues, but it goes to the states and then it goes to funds um, uh, that go to the businesses. And so, um, and it just helps uh, within the form of equity investment um, and will really help to jumpstart uh, businesses, especially in areas that we haven't had a lot of, of startups even before the pandemic. Yeah, it is It is really a, a federal state partnership that you've structured in the bill and you've worked and your staff worked for a while on getting it right. Uh, John Deary and the Center for American Entrepreneurship uh, really rallied uh, a number of groups to, to weigh in and, and you and your colleagues, Senators uh, Coons, Kane, King, uh, mm -hmm. Your Minnesota colleague, Dean Phillips, Rokana, a number of others. In the house. Well, yeah, they did the bill in the House, yes. Yeah. And, and you introduced it in March as the CARES Act uh, was really being put together. And, and at the time, there seemed to be some consensus that the congressional response 
to the crisis would continue to evolve as, as the virus persisted. That hasn't been the case. Uh, we're now in mid-September. Uh, there's an uncertain prospect uh, for additional relief uh, for existing small businesses, uh, never mind for new businesses and entrepreneurs. So we still seem very much in crisis uh, and relief mode. Can you comment on that at all and sort of what you're seeing in Congress? And, and, and I think also, you know, support for entrepreneurship has, you know, traditionally been pretty bipartisan. Um, so uh, interested in your thoughts about how you can, you know, convince your colleagues across the aisle to, to sponsor the New Business Preservation Act and, and that this is really a bill that should be a centerpiece of, of recovery efforts. And as you know, I work pretty well across the aisle. I think I don't know how many times during the presidential campaign I cited the fact that I passed the most bills with Republicans. Yes, and it was such a winning message. Um, but that was, that was true. God. But I, um, I um, continue to believe this is how we get things done, and especially in this area. And I have, by the way, I've done a big, big two billion dollar broadband bill with uh, Senator Kramer. A number of bills in North Dakota with Senator Grassley on uh, our farm economy. So there just continues to be uh, Senator Cornyn and I did the Save Our Stages bill. So I just tell you that because that was a $10 billion bill. Um, because um, I think there is still bipartisan support to invest right now. I think everyone knows we're going to get a vaccine, but it's not going to be this week. And we've got to get through these next six months to eight months, uh, whatever time period it is. And so I think the way you build support for this bill, um, and I ask you guys to help me, is to reach out to Republicans. We have clearly uh, moderate Democrats on this bill right now, and that's really important. Um, and I guess practically, there is going to be a package at some point. I don't know, from my mind, we're going to have a Joe Biden presidency. Maybe not everyone agrees on the call, but we will. And um, when that happens, um, we're going to have a package then. It is very possible we'll have it before then uh, because uh, there's still people in Treasury working on this. Uh, there's a thought that we could have some major collapse in part of the economy um, and that when that happens, that usually triggers action, whether it's before or after the election. Um, so I could see major things coming together. So the way to try to get this done is to try to get it attached to whatever major package there is. And again, simply because there's been a debate over this HEROES Act, um, and I'm, I think it's sad that we haven't moved on it. I'm, I'm one that um, is really focused on the debt, but I think this is a moment where we have to invest, and even a lot of Republican economists agree, um, to keep our, our uh, country strong, just as we did, by the way, way back in the last downturn with TARP. I know that thing wasn't popular. I did support it uh, because I believed it would help us, and it did. It helped us get through. Well, I would say I think your skills as a legislator have uh, been known to Minnesotans for a long time, and I think the rest of the country uh, got to learn more about that over the last year, and everyone from the New York Times to my mom in Pennsylvania uh, really uh, appreciated that. So. Um, so talk to us a little bit, if you would, just about the urgency uh, in, this, in this climate right now and, and why supporting entrepreneurs can't go sort of unnoticed uh, with, with a lot of other competing priorities. Yeah. Well, as I said, we're in this startup slump. Um, actually, Senator Tim Scott, the Republican from South Carolina, and I started this entrepreneurship caucus uh, for this reason. And then the pandemic came, and so we, were, we had been planning to do things across the country on it. Um, and so I think that we know there was an issue before. And part of the reason is we've got these incredible hubs of wonderful innovation, Silicon Valley, Boston, Cambridge area, New York City, but they're about 80% of all venture capital investment, up from 60% as recently as 2008. And then you have other areas, you know, Chicago, Austin, but then there's a big clip. And that just is not, to me, you want other hubs in other parts of the country in addition to those. And that's part of the reasoning of this bill. Um, and not just because of the obvious, you wanna get talent from all over the country. And also because of you want growing support politically, 
economically for startups and that is harder to do when there's no startups in your area um, so that's part of it and um, it's better for the economy you can have places that have now I know a lot of this remote right now but eventually when we go back to work um, you can have places that have less expensive cost of living where people can live and meet and be in a business um, and you want to make sure you spread that out. And then the last thing I'll say on this front is just we don't want to miss the great next inventor because she is a woman or um, a minority. Um, and so the idea in this bill is for those areas that already have substantial um, investment in startups uh, that you actually put priorities on uh, women and minority businesses. Um, so it's a combination of that. And um, so, and I think we've seen this all come in technicolor for all of us this summer. Um, didn't really, it was existing and focused, I think, during the pandemic with what was going on with the effect on minority communities. But then, of course, really brought in a big way after the murder of George Floyd in my state. Um, and that the answer is, of course, um, um, police reform and other things, but the answer also is investing in these communities and in these entrepreneurs. Um, so that's another piece of this bill. That, it's a critical piece of the bill. I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to as well. And, and, and um, I think you place an emphasis on that. And, and there, there's just a, um, a level of intentionality that um, mm -hmm. is required. Um, and so I uh, appreciate you making that um, uh, part of the bill. Um, you are a uh, ranking member of the Judiciary Committee on uh, uh, Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust. Oh, thank um, you for bringing that up. Not everyone knows that. Yes. And, and should Senate, should Democrats take the Senate, you may very likely chair that subcommittee. And, and, and competition policy uh, is really important to small businesses as well. And so I was wondering if you yes. had a comment on that. As, as I as would well. love to comment on that. I could go on for an hour, but you know, you might lose zoom viewers um, but um, people are really going to have to come to grips with how important this is because um, and I like to call it like you did competition policy instead of antitrust which you know antitrust dates back to Teddy Roosevelt's time and before um, and what's interesting when you look back at the history of our country and I want to make clear this is pro entrepreneurship to make sure we have an even playing field for small businesses. This goes all the way back to the founders of our country who threw the tea into the harbor uh, in Boston, and not just because of taxation without representation, but also because they didn't want to be beholden to the East Indian Tea Company and have uh, the British government tell them uh, where they get their tea. And so there was this strong, strong history of economic independence uh, going way back there. And actually Adam Smith that he feared uh, the army of monopolies um, and then you fast forward to Roosevelt's time and uh, what happened uh, during the Gilded Age when you had all these big trusts and then it was small businesses and farmers in the Midwest um, and laborers and others that said hey uh, we want a piece of this too this isn't fair and out of that grew our competition policy and really in recent years it has faded part of it is because of court opinions Part of it is that we haven't really adapted to this new environment with these big mega companies and how we're going to question mergers um, and how we're going to um, make sure that monopsonies are covered and other things. So um, I'm really interested in moving ahead on the legislative front on this. And this is steeped in history of, of pro-small business um, litigation and pro-small business um, provisions in the past, which uh, really say things like, wait a minute, we've got a new economy, we haven't adapted. Um, and the big tech companies are now, I think, 20% of the stock market. And I do not at all quarrel with their success. I think it's great. They brought us great stuff. But when they start being able to buy out every small company, um, which maybe has an immediate gain in the long term, then we don't have any competition and we lose that kind of innovation. Thank you. You'll be in a good position to, to, to take that on and, and combine with policies like the New Business Preservation Act, which is uh, we, we see as being critical. And so um, we're going to pause and, and this is going to lead into a, a discussion about that legislation shortly. So uh, thank you again for the time. You have a number All of right. uh, high profile issues that you're involved in. And so uh, taking time to talk with us about this one um, uh, is really appreciated. It's great. I look forward to working with all of you guys. And thanks, Chris. Thanks for your leadership. 
Thank you so much, Senator. Great. Well, we are so appreciative to Senator Klobuchar for taking the time to, to speak with us uh, earlier this week. And I think that uh, is a really nice segue into um, our discussion. And I'll turn it over to our Vice President, Chris Levin, uh, to lead us off. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, and thanks again to Senator Klobuchar and her team for arranging that uh, conversation. Uh, and thanks to you all for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, we have a great group of panelists. Uh, to talk about supporting new businesses and entrepreneurs in this moment uh, as we turn to recovery from the COVID economic crisis. Uh, we'll pick up on Senator Klobuchar's remarks in a moment. I want to first introduce our panel. Uh, Donna Harris is a venture partner at Praxis, uh, the founder of Builders and Backers, uh, co-founder and managing partner of 1776 Ventures, and was previously managing director of the Startup America Partnership. Donna also serves on EIG's Policy Council. Welcome, Donna. Eric Cromwell is a national leader on technology-based economic development, uh, working with dozens of states and intermediaries. He served as Tennessee's first ever director of technology and subsequently founded Launch Tennessee. Uh, between 2012 and 2017, Eric advised the Treasury Department uh, with technical assistance on states' uh, uh, venture capital programs supported by the uh, State Small Business Credit Initiative, which we'll hear a little bit about today. Ken Morris is the founder and CEO of Connect IQ, a Minnesota-based cybersecurity firm. Uh, Ken is a longtime entrepreneur, executive, founder of several startups with expertise in cybersecurity, medical devices, healthcare, and financial services, and more. And finally, Jennifer Teagan is managing director of New York Ventures, a division of Empire State Development, which is a $100 million investment fund. Uh, allocated towards direct equity investments into uh, promise, promising Series A uh, round startups in New York State. Uh, prior to joining Empire State Development, Jennifer spent nearly 20 years in the private sector where she invested in supported entrepreneurs and uh, technology-based startups. So we, we heard from Senator Klobuchar and, and she noted up front pretty clearly that even before the pandemic, uh, entrepreneurship has been in poor health. She called it a, a startup slump, uh, which we've been in for some time. Uh, fewer and fewer uh, new companies have been coming online and, and even the recovery from the Great Recession did little to um, uh, improve the, the rate of new business formation. And so we're in this economic situation uh, today, which feels uh, very uncertain now across the board uh, and downright dire in, in many communities. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the legislation uh, in a bit, but I wanted to start with the right framework uh, and just and pose the question. I'll start with Donna. I want to hear from our panel. Uh, why is entrepreneurship uh, so important in this current moment uh, as we face a health and, and economic crisis? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, I, I think the senator teed it up really well. You know, that most communities across the country, their economic engines are stalled, and they were stalled prior to COVID-19, right, since the sort of early 2000s, and even more so in the wake of the Great Recession, a few communities are doing really well. The companies, the, the talent, and the capital uh, have been clustering there, and that leaves the rest of American communities sort of locked in this downward spiral. Fewer people starting companies, which attracts fewer people, which creates sort of the spiral of, of, um, of distress. And so, you know, it's not just economic distress, but it's also social distress, right? We have communities struggling with things like opioid crisis and loneliness and suicide. We've got a divisive country with, you know, sort of boiling over anger. These things are all very interconnected. And so our communities are the epicenter for all of this. It's where all of this boiling point uh, begins to boil over and is met. And so, you know, left unattended, that was only going to worsen as the years we're going to go by without sort of proactive action. And then you overlay a pandemic and an economic crisis where, you know, a year ago, we had 1.7 million people unemployed. We have 12.6 million people unemployed right now, right? We, even in the, in the depths of the Great Recession, there were never weekly jobless claims over 700,000 people. We haven't been below that number since the beginning of the pandemic, right? So we, we, we have an enormous, enormous job crisis. And we, we think well, big companies, big employers, this is, is maybe how we're gonna fill that gap, but it's not. If we look at the S&P 500, a decade ago, they employed almost 
uh, two and a half times the number of people per billion dollars in revenue than they employ today. And that's a lot having to do with the dominance of technology and platform companies um, merely needing to employ different numbers, lower numbers of people because of their business model. So, you know, it's, it is, entrepreneurship is the giant lever that we have and that we have to pull here if we're actually going to create the jobs. But it's also how we're going to solve the challenges we face, right? We, we've got healthcare challenges and education challenges and environmental challenges. And it's how we're going to actually ideate and come up with new ways to tackle these challenges. And it's how our communities can restore a sense of agency and ownership over, you know, the sense that, that I see what's broken around me and I can play a role in fixing it. Entrepreneurial entrepreneurship is the way to do that, but we haven't really created a national culture and a national imperative and a national funding infrastructure to enable people to participate in that. And it's disproportionately impacting certain communities, certain demographics, and we're literally starving much of our country of the fuel that they need and the call to action that they need in order to be a part of, of this really critical task. So it's a, it is an enormous lever um, that we absolutely have to be pulling and I'm glad to see legislation like this coming out. Thanks, Donna. Ken, do you wanna pick up on, on that? Oh, you may, Entrepre there you go. Yep. We've talked uh, before about entrepreneurism being the glue or part of the glue that actually holds society together. Uh, organizations, uh, be they large, small, communities large or small, thrive when there is this sense of hope that in fact one can be engaged in not only creating more prosperity for themselves, but also for their families, friends, and neighbors. Uh, and right now we are seeing this dearth uh, across a variety of communities, particularly I think impacting minority communities and women-owned businesses as well, that the risk associated with uh, starting an enterprise and entrepreneurs by nature tend to be less risk averse. So that's, that's not so much of a problem, but there has to be this sense of if I'm going to engage in this endeavor, that it is going to pay off, not just for me as an individual, but also for sort of the greater community that's around me. And so we tend to, to see uh, the normal barriers that all entrepreneurs face. And this is access to capital. This is do I have the relevant networks uh, to grow my enterprise? Uh, do I have structures around me that are supportive of, of business generation? And in a lot of communities, we don't really see that. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, I am a market guy. I mean, that's, that's, that's how I'm wired. I, I'm, I tend to be less enamored of, of governmental uh, solutions. But there are occasions where if the market is simply not moving that it's opportunities for uh, good policy uh, to move things forward. And the concept behind the new, new Business Preservation Act, I think is sound in terms of where we need to end up. Uh, if we think about even some of the large companies that were small companies, uh, the founders had some things in common. So if you look at a Bill Gates, Bill Gates came from a fairly wealthy family. Uh, most people don't know that Steve Jobs was definitely upper middle class. Uh, and so you have this this environment where it's less pre prevalent in certainly communities of color that people will have institutional or generational assets from which to draw to begin to move their ideas forward. And uh, all of this tends to culminate in is the necessary fuel in the sense of capital there behind some of these great ideas to actually help uh, individuals and the companies that they're looking to found and grow um, is that present. And in many cases, it's not. Eric and, and Jennifer, you've been able to sort of sit on the crossroads between or private sector uh, as well as the public and deal with intermediaries on the state and local level. Eric, maybe starting with you, uh, tell us a little bit about sort of the framework that you sort of approach these questions. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, so those were great uh, informative comments. I think what I would add is, um, venture capital that supports startups and innovation development just is a very different um, problem to solve than lending and credit support. And, and so from a policy perspective, whether you're at the federal level or the state or the local level, sometimes I get into these conversations where, where it's almost like we're pitting those against each other, whether you're trying to support big business or small business or startups. 
And, and I really think that's unproductive because there are different types of challenges and opportunities that require different types of policy interventions and levers. And what we're primarily talking about today are startups that are typically young, small businesses, but have the potential for scalability and extraordinary growth. And most often they're developing some type of innovation, a, a product innovation, a service innovation, something that is transformative and solving a problem in a big market. Those companies, those startups are funded by equity financing. They're funded by venture capital. And so one thing that was interesting, and we'll talk about SSBCI maybe in a little bit as a reference to the new Business Preservation Act, but one thing was interesting coming out of the Great Recession is that as the banks and the lending apparatus in the country begin to stabilize, it became apparent by many states that there is a pervasive issue with venture capital. And this geographic concentration in too few markets, we firmly believe constrains innovation development and economic growth that is absolutely needed on a state-by-state -state basis and as our country as a whole. If America wants to invent and win the future, we need more venture capital resources located locally in more markets. And that aligns with some of that innovation capacity that Don and Kim were talking about. So that's, that's kind of my take is it's a different problem requiring different policy interventions. And we need to be smart about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good. Jennifer? Sure. So, you know, I, I, I love what Eric said and completely echo his sentiment. And, you know, people, I, you know, you hear in the venture capital industry all the time, people saying, well, the money will follow the good deals. And that's just not the case. It's absolutely a fallacy that only New York City, Boston, and San Francisco have innovators and technologies and startups that are worthy of investment. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more attention being paid to that. But quite honestly, the public sector has really fallen down on addressing that need. And so I think that, uh, you know, the having some thoughtful policy to help the private, you know, private sector begin to address it in a more broad way for the underserved geographies and the underrepresented women and minority communities to access the capital that they need to grow their businesses and to start those, you know, great innovative technology solutions is, is absolutely needed right now. Jennifer, maybe sticking with you and, and you know, going a little deeper on those, those additional hurdles that um, particularly women and, and minority uh, entrepreneurs face. Can, any observations just from, from New York State's fund and how, how the state has gone about trying to uh, address that? Yeah, you know, we, we have great intentionality in what we do around investing in women and minority entrepreneurs. And it's just been part of our DNA to make sure that we do that. Um, but we also, as part being part of Empire State Development and part of New York State, we have a lot of great programs to help support women and minority entrepreneurs. And I regularly get phone calls from my colleagues about companies that I should be taking a look at. Uh, but right now, our direct fund has 48% investment in women and minorities. Um, because quite honestly, we just look to make sure that any investment that we make or most any investment we make has a diverse team of entrepreneurs because honestly, it also makes business and investment sense. You know, it, you can look at the, the record of those companies and, and uh, you know, and, and the record of, record of profitability of, of, of big, bigger companies um, and see that it just, you know, investing wise, those companies are more successful. So we think it makes great sense for us, not only for um, you know the state generally and for New Yorkers, but also just for making good investments. But you know, if you look at women and minority entrepreneurs and the and the sources of capital that they traditionally have had access to, uh, it's more expensive capital, and so the threshold of uh, you know the the margin that they're working with relative to surviving something like an economic downturn is very thin. And so unfortunately, those businesses tend to fail more quickly in, in situations like this. Thanks for that. And Ken, I'm interested in your thoughts too. I and mean, you, I think you, you touched upon just the importance of networks and that relationships uh, matter. And, and just interested from your experience and your observations, just um, how are some of those, how are some of those patterns um, begin to, how do you begin to chip away at some of those patterns? Um, yeah. that factor into a lot of the decisions of whether to invest 
into a uh, into an you know, with an entrepreneur um, who might be higher risk for whatever reason. Uh, Chris, thank you. That's uh, that's a great point about this issue of patterns. Um, I've had uh, opportunities to chat with VCs on all the coasts, and the, the the common common thread that tends to come through is, and again, no disparagement to to my fellow entrepreneurs, however seasoned they may be. Uh, entre uh, VCs, much like uh, just the rest of us human beings, we tend to look for patterns. We tend to be a bit more machine learning like, a bit more AI like, and we look for what has worked before. And so you, you tend to see a pattern, and particularly we see this in, in, in West Coast, where uh, did you go to the right school? Did you, do you have attributes that may be like founders of, of some of the largest tech companies, which is the world I live in? Uh, do you sort of look like that? Do you behave like that? Do you have networks and relationships among that? This is one of the reasons that uh, the Valley has done so well in terms of its concentration. Uh, it is a very uh, tight network of who knows who, and the deals get done. Sure, it's gotta be a good idea, um, as a general rule, but the deals get done primarily on the back of who knows who and where. And if you are a VC and you don't have relationships with minority or women-owned founders, it becomes very difficult to map what you know tends to be more successful against something that you're now looking at that may have a fabulous idea, as Eric mentioned earlier, that changes the game. Uh, I look at what we've done here. Uh, it's now being recognized globally that in fact, the problems that exist today with what we consider standards for securing data as it's moving around are fundamentally broken. And we fixed that, uh, but we fixed it in an, uh, in an orthogonal way. And we did it because did not go to Berkeley, did not go to Stanford, went to great schools, but coming at the problem fundamentally differently, asking questions that are not buried in what we accept uh, to be the norm. That challenge of patterning and norming still exists among VCs everywhere. And so it raises this interesting question about, as you said, how do you begin to break that? Well, number one, uh, minority uh, founders and entrepreneurs have to get to know uh, individuals at a personal, not just a professional level within the VC community. Two, it's going to be uncomfortable and a lot, in large measure for everyone in this particular process. And people have to be willing to build bridges. Now, the question becomes who bears the responsibility for sort of doing the capstone? Uh, I think that falls in large measure on the VC community uh, because you're asking individuals who have historically not had access to these individuals to try and figure out how do I navigate this particular environment? And I have no, there's no instruction set. I don't see anybody by and large that's gone for me that I could talk to. And so, uh, those VCs who are truly interesting uh, in how do we build this robust, prosperity-driven environment for all communities and opportunities for everyone to contribute, uh, I believe the accountability and duty probably uh, lies there. But at the same time, uh, minority founders as myself, we have to be willing to engage uh, in those particular markets as I will frame them up. Um, as well. Uh, until those relationships uh, form, there's trust built among the individuals and the communities, it's going to be a little difficult uh, to frame that. And if I can use a, a, a football or NFL analogy, we did not see a lot of minority coaches in the NFL. There were some until Art Rooney decided to create the Rooney Rule. Didn't say you had to hire somebody, but you at least had to get to know them. And how that happened was simply through interviews. And over time, what we've now seen is a growing list. And some people say it's still not enough, um, you know, if you're sort of counting people in seats. But the progress is there because people basically needed to go and, and stand up and be account uh, accountable and engage the process. And what they came to realize is great ideas, great talent can come from anywhere, but you don't know that until you sort of step out of a particular comfort zone. And this is everybody uh, to engage in the process. Great, thanks, thanks, Ken. Donna, do you wanna add on to that? I'd love to, because I, I think in terms of this sort of pattern thematic, you know, one of the biggest things that I found in my research the last three years is 
we need to put the financial court back, cart back behind the innovation horse. Capital is supposed to be a means to an end, but we've made it the main event. And in many cases, we've made it the only event, right? So part of my job over the last decade has been to focus on building startup ecosystems and startup communities. But we've sort of foundationally put venture capital as the core goal and assumption of a lot of these startup communities. Our events are no longer really about sort of meeting mentors and coaches and experts and customers. It's really pitch events to pitch for capital. Incubators and accelerators, the formula is, and the curriculums are all about venture capital. And those are great things, but our communities need an entire stack of capital of which VC should be a small portion of it, right? But, but in most communities, com community banks have been decimated. Literally now four banks control more capital than all of our nation's community banks combined, right? So, and by the way, big banks make a fraction of the small business loans that the com their community bank counterparts would make, right? 23%, even though they control almost 70% of the industry's assets. So, you know, VC has sort of become it in, in the only game. And there's some sort of troubling aspects beyond that, that, you know, they're making much bigger bets at later stage, which means our earlier stage companies, no matter where they're located, aren't really getting access to the capital. And we're uh, more and more reliant on venture capital because companies are staying private longer. It used to be from seed round to IPO was three to four years. It's now a decade or longer. So much of what needs to happen is certainly how do we unlock more venture capital? How do we change the pattern matching that is overlooking, you know, frankly, more than half of our population? But we also have to think about what does this entire capital stack look like in communities? And not be so myopic about sort of it's VC or nothing. We could be doing debt funds. We could be doing revenue-based funds. We could be doing funds with blended returns, donor advised funds, investing in social innovation. You know, in terms of, you know, following a formula and pattern matching, venture capital is pretty much a formula that communities have said, mm -hmm. that's the formula we're going to copy for funding our startups. And it's caused us to miss the entire pyramid, except the teeny tiny top. And then we're wondering why there's not enough happening. So, you know, I really think this concept of pattern matching, we have to think about in terms of how can we use the tools that are becoming available at the federal level or, or get creative with new tools at the state and local level or in the private sector to, to put this cart back behind the horse and focus first on innovation. And then what's the right financial vehicle that we need to make sure is in place so that we can fund across that entire capital stack from singles and doubles that are small businesses to the home runs that are gonna become the unicorns and let them do that in their own community. We're not trying to put a man on the moon here. We, we literally just need to get creative about how we're gonna deploy capital using the legal vehicles that already exist. That's probably a, a good segue and I wanna to turn to Eric. Um, you know, to look at existing tools or ones that have worked previously and, and you've been involved uh, or you were involved with the state small business credit initiative I uh, wonder if you can talk about that and, and also share how sort of a part of the structure of that has been modeled in the New Business Preservation Act. Sure. So in, in my view, the reality is that the federal government has a gap in its portfolio of programs on how it supports innovation development. And, and what I mean by that is in any given year, the federal government will pump billions of dollars into basic research billions of dollars into SBIR programs, um, billions of dollars into kind of growth equity lending initiatives. But then what's happened is they've leapfrogged one of the most important parts of the business financing life cycle, and that is more of the early stage equity finance, i.e. venture capital. And so we pump all this money into the economy to generate early stage innovation, but then the feds are absent from the conversation on how to then support the commercialization of all that underlying innovation infrastructure into something to commercial value. And so the states over the past 20 years have really played the lead role in trying to step into that policy arena to say what are things that a state government can do to try to stimulate and catalyze private sector investment in our ecosystems. And so the real innovation in the marketplace, if you will, on the policy side about how to support private investment has really come more from the states. Well, what happened coming out of the Great Recession is when Congress and the president turned their attention 
to kind of what happens with Main Street companies after bailing out Wall Street is that the Small Business Jobs Act of 2010 was passed and a component of that created what was called the State Small Business Credit Initiative. And this was a federal state partnership where every state received a funding allocation and they could decide the best program structure on how to deploy that money down to small business. And what was really interesting was there was just one line of that legislative framework that allowed for other types of credit support programs and venture capital initiatives. And so 36 states in SSBCI opted to take at least some or all of that allocation from the federal government to then create a state venture capital program of variety strategies. And so that was a, a really incredible experiment that ran where you know, we got to see all these different types of program structures around the country be implemented and now kind of measure those results. So that helped kind of set the stage for what's possible with the New Business, New Business Preservation Act. But the new act would be exclusively focused on equity finance and how do we stimulate that part of the economy. I want to, I want to turn back to you in a moment, Eric, but Jennifer, just your, your observations of, the, of what Eric described with SSBCI. Tell us from your view in New York State how, how that worked and even examples of, of that um, leading to you know, job retention or creation. Sure. And, and actually, I, uh, in my private sector job, which I only left a few months back, I, I sat on the other side of the table of the SSBCI. I was one of the chosen fund managers um, that managed that, that, that fund uh, or for our, our, our individual fund, the Cuga Venture Fund. So, and now I'm, I'm on the other side of it with New York State and, and looking at it from you know, the, the full on perspective. So for New York State, that program has been incredibly successful and it really kicked off our larger initiative around investing in equity in innovation companies. With the SSBCI program, we had $36 million that was then uh, and then brought in another 10 million from Goldman Sachs on the private sector to have a fund that was $46 million. We chose seven fund managers, uh, four of whom, by the way, were uh, uh, women-led. Uh, I, I, I think they were all women and no minorities in that, but we did have a, a good number of women uh, emerging fund managers as fund partners. Um, and then by the end and close of that program in 2018, uh, it had created more than 2,200 jobs, uh, $333 million of co-investment capital from the private sector that matched our investment capital from the state. So um, with that program, we had a two to one match component. So for every dollar that we put in, we expected another $2 on the private sector side because, and actually that's part of our DNA, um, even now with our direct fund at New York State, and it's been super successful. We've had 13 exits to date. Um, about a third of the fund has been returned and we fully expect to get all of the capital returned if not better than, than that. Uh, actually, I expect quite a bit better, but I'm not gonna say which companies we hope that will be from. So, um, you know, generally it's been, it's been super. And, and to be honest, given, um, you know, the situation with the pandemic and the states being in budget crisis, and it's not a shock to anybody that um, New York State is um, right in a square in the middle of that, that the, the funds that have been recycled out of that program have helped to continue to fuel our ability to support the innovation ecosystem and to continue to support startups in this uh, climate. So it's been a great program. And from the fund side, I'll just speak quickly to that. You know, it's, it's hard living in Ithaca, New York, outside of, you know, I'm still in New York State, but I'm, way, you know, New York City and Ithaca are, are two different countries, really. So, um, you know, when you're, an emer when you're a small fund manager and you're trying to find sources of capital to invest in your region, you know, it's a lifeline to get money through a program like this to be able to support the innovation ecosystem and to, to find great entrepreneurs out of Cornell University or the University of Rochester, or any of the number of great other universities that we have in New York State. So, um, you know, getting that, that money in order to help raise our fund and, and to continue to operate and to invest in the great entrepreneurs that we knew that we had in our backyard was amazing. So, from the fund perspective, it was super important, super helpful, and you know, my fund partners are continuing um, 
to, to run, uh, you know, run their fund on the, on the back of that as well. So um, New York State has since created two additional fund to fund programs, as well as a $100 million direct fund uh, equity investment program. So, uh, you know, it, it definitely was the seed of something that that has become much larger for our state and for our entrepreneurs in the state. Great. Eric, you earlier, I think your opening comments was referred to just sort of the right kind of policy intervention for given, given environment situation. Um, startups have a high rate of failure. Um, there are those who would question whether this is a smart use of, uh, of federal government resources. Um, sticking to the New Business Preservation Act, maybe more so than SSBCI, but why, why is this an appropriate um, uh, policy intervention? How does it strike? Um, a balance in your view? Yeah, great question. Um, so, so I think one thing needs to be emphasized, and this kind of is coming up maybe in the comment section as well, is the objective of this type of policy initiative is to build local investment capacity. So, so the idea and the objective here is not to try to get a Silicon Valley based venture investment firm to change their behavior and, and all of a sudden say, now we're going to source all these investment opportunities you know, a thousand miles away or 2000 miles away, that's not going to happen, nor is it the right policy intervention. What this legislation and programs like it are intended to do is support local investors to have additional investment resources available to invest locally. Because in my opinion, this idea of transient venture capital, that money's just going to flow from San Francisco across the country, just doesn't hold up. You have to have local, credible, connected investors in your local ecosystems because venture investing is not just about the money, it's about all the additional support services that can be provided alongside that capital. At least that's how good venture investing is done. So this is all about how do we get more investment capacity built in more regions? So I'll kind of tie that into your question about the risk profile. Venture investing is a risky asset class where the opportunity for an investment failure is very high but then when you have successful returns, that is also very high. So there's an offsetting dynamic here in a portfolio approach. And so if you study portfolio theory, the idea around a program of this size is that when the capital is spread across all different types of states and program structures and ecosystems, that overall, you will have a positive net return, both on the financial return perspective and also on all the economic development impacts that are created through these types of investment mechanisms. So there's a lot of ways to measure success, but we would argue that you really need to include the financial return that states can continue to reinvest in their ecosystems year after year after year. And then also in a very credible and accurate way, because there's some, some iffy accounting on some of these economic development programs, but in a very meaningful and transparent way, really show how that investment did in fact cause or have a correlating effect on private sector investment and then the additional capacity building, which can mean a number of things over the years in that state. So that's how it all starts to come together in a portfolio approach. Uh, that, that leads me to Jennifer and Donna. You, so you've both worked with, with entrepreneurs as venture capitalists, as we've talked about. Um, just building on Eric's comments there, you know, what lessons do you take away from, from that experience? And, and um, you know, how does that apply now to your support for entrepreneurship in other ways? Sure. I mean, I think Eric's point, there are two points that, that I would just double down on and, and add to. So one is, you know, the way that, that this legislation is structured, you, you almost look at this like a giant countrywide portfolio of things that we're investing in. And so even if failure rates hold as to what they are, that also means we've created a ton of companies that have succeeded. So there is even at sort of baseline metrics, um, a giant portfolio of companies that have been jump started and gotten stimulated based on that. And the second is, if you think about the sense of being able to use this to unlock capital, right? Americans gave nearly a half a trillion to charity in 2019, half a trillion dollars. If you add foundation money, right? Sort of the community foundation, you add corporate, you're talking almost a almost a trillion dollars that this wealth is wealth is out there wealth is in every every state every community in the country has some modicum of wealth that could be deployed there's just not an incentive or a program or a call to action to do it and so in many communities as jennifer was saying like 
these kinds of programs can be the linchpin to unlock some of that capital and to unlock some of that wealth that currently is looking at, you know, we're using philanthropy to try to stem some of the challenges that our communities face. And if we could deploy even a tiny little bit of that toward building and solving and creating new businesses and creating this sense of flourishing in our community and the new ideas and the new companies supported by this portfolio of money coming from the federal government in this program, it ends up being a win, not just for local communities, but for the country as a whole, because we've generated potentially millions of new businesses. Jennifer, more do you want to add to that? Okay. Uh, Chris, uh, if, uh, ahead, if, yeah, if, Please. If, if I might add to that as well, you know, certainly speaking as an entrepreneur who's, you know, it's not my first rodeo, uh, one of the things that can certainly be done is to provide some level of incentive uh, for dealing with what is perceived to be a higher risk. And in some cases, it might be if one is looking at the numbers, particularly as you think about minority enterprises and, and however one might define that. There are things that can be done for uh, sources of capital that may be uh, tax credits. There may be uh, things that can be done to incent uh, those sources of capital. And for example, we did primarily a family friends round. The, I, I wasn't sort of, in, I wasn't enamored at uh, sort of the models that I saw coming out of Silicon Valley and some of the other places. And so we've been moderately successful. I mean, we've raised close to $3 million uh, for our particular enterprise. And there are some who would say that that's extraordinarily successful. Well, because of the global impact that, that, that we're having and will have, yeah, that's probably a modicum of what's actually needed uh, to, to get the job done. And so we're continuing to, to work in that regard. But reducing or de-risking, or perceived de-risking anyway, um, is I think a helpful tool and there are levers that can be pulled and provide uh, for uh, those who want to invest. Maybe we have to even go beyond how we think about what falls into an accredited in, uh, investor. Sure, there are things like crowdfunding and all of that is available, um, but I think there are opportunities for a lot of communities who may have uh, dollars to invest that uh, could be favorably looked upon by the SEC and, and a few other organizations and agencies as we think about where, uh, to Donna's point, capital is everywhere. The question is, are we going to allow it to be unleashed um, in a variety of communities so that we can have this jumpstart effect? Uh, communities tend to do pretty well if, if we can get out of the way and, and, and help them get things done. Uh, and that's, that, that's always a challenge when you're looking at uh, issues around, around legislation in terms of the types of rules that are in place or existing uh, requirements are in place that tend to inhibit uh, communities banding together and doing what they will do quite well as long as we can uh, sort of create an environment that encourages uh, entrepreneurs to actually go take a risk, run hard, and build business models that, to Eric's point, are game-changing. Uh, that tends not to happen if, if we have the current model where we have sort of collapsed uh, the sort of centers of funding in certain places around the country. Uh, I, I have no doubt that, in fact, if you had, and not to necessarily pick on my, my colleagues in, in Silicon Valley, but I will for a moment love them all, uh, give them the proper incentive or any funder the proper incentive to say, why won't I, I should create a center here in Minneapolis, Kansas City, New Orleans, it doesn't really matter. But uh, if we can get the incentives aligned right, uh, the market tends to take care of itself. Might be a little glacial in some instances, but at least we can begin to get this process moving as opposed to, to uh, what's happening today where the, the centers of capital tend to still operate by sort of pre-existing notions about what success looks like and who success looks like and where success looks like. I want to pick up on that great thought with a, a question from, from the audience, which is, um, you know, how do we ensure that there's a proper level of transparency uh, with policies like this uh, and, and seeing that, you know, the intent is great um, and, and that, uh, you know, policies that promote inclusivity and equitable com competition, great. Um, but sometimes in practice that may not always sort of pan out. And so maybe Jennifer, just, I know, uh, with, with New York state's, 
uh, efforts and setting sort of public targets, I think, of, of, um, of where it wants and who it wants to fund and where. Um, do you have any thoughts on just sort of how transparency could be ensured and, and meaningful? Sure, I know even um, from the SSBCI program, we had to provide regular um, both quarterly and annual reports back to the, the, uh, to the state. Um, so it did create a little extra effort on our part, but quite honestly, it was, it was worth it for the funding, but also it was worth it for us, uh, you know, not, not out of the ordinary for what we would provide. So I think you know, when you're um, working with, you know, most, most venture funds have to report to somebody, right? They have LPs or they have other partners that they need to share information with. And so the transparency is not such a big concern for me as long as the states and the program is very clear as to what their expectations are. And hopefully they're not, you know, super onerous, but if, you know, if people care about the amount of capital being deployed to women and minorities, certainly, um, you know, that should be a part of the, the reporting and, and, and making sure that um, people understand that. So, um, you know, it's, I, I think it's not hard for most fund managers to, to you know, provide the reports back to the states and to the program in order to, one, provide that level of um, consistency and confidence in the uh, public sector that the monies are being well spent. Eric, any additional quick thoughts? Yeah, that, that's a really good question and a really important question. So, so a couple of things um, just to alleviate probably some concerns that people might be thinking. Um, so one is there is a protection mechanism that requires a one-to-one -one private capital investment match for all the federal money deployed. So in other words, this isn't public dollars being put at risk without any private sector investment. It has to be equal participation by the private sector. And many states set up programs to where the private sector actually has to lead that investment. And the government is simply that provider of the source through a, a private intermediary. Okay, so that, that's one. The second is this is not an example of government playing the role of venture capital investor. So this isn't someone at treasury making investment decisions. It's not the governor of a state saying, hey, I, I wanna put some money over into this company. This is administered by the state government agency that ends up applying for the dollars. But then the federal resources come down and the investment decisions are made and managed by private entities. So, so again, it's not government doing this or picking winners and losers, which we hear all the time. This is supporting the private sector and catalyzing private sector investment. Um, the third thing I would say is you almost need a federal framework in a program like what would be created through the New Business Preservation Act to provide some consistency for how states do in fact report and account on these types of initiatives. Because what happens, and we saw this well before SSBCI's implementation, states kind of do their own thing. And so to have an overarching framework to say, well, here's the things you need to report on. Here's what we expect as far as your conflicts of interest policies to make sure these funds are appropriately accounted for and there's no conflicts. Having a federal framework to get all the states organized and consistent is really, really impactful to this industry. Right. Yeah, Chris, if, if I might Sorry. add one, Please can. one particular item. Um, I tend to be one who believes that uh, policies work best when they're close to being local. And so uh, the, the idea of having a, a reporting framework from a federal standpoint, I think that's probably fair. The, the experimentation that can happen, hopefully in a positive way, if we get the incentives aligned right, uh, states have the opportunity to at least produce what's best, not only just there, but also what can be adopted by other states. The, uh, you know, the issues around reporting, uh, while that's fine, at least to sort of keep score in terms of what's happening, but I look at behavioral change and what are we going to do and how will policies of this type uh, encourage those who are responsible for investment decisions within the, the several states to actually behave in ways that are useful, not just short term, but also long term. Uh, and these may be in opposite to how they practice today. Uh, and right now, if if, if someone is engaged in uh, being a, a you know, capital funder, whether they're a VC, whether they're a super angel, and that's probably some things we should look at as well, is, uh, is there a place in here for some of these super angels to play who have sufficient capital that they can write on their own, and they're not necessarily part of a VC network. Uh, those individuals exist. There are many of them who want to help. Uh, 
but to the extent that we, again, we can get the incentives aligned that people say, I choose to engage in this process, I think is useful for long-term uh, and hopefully sustainable change, as opposed to what we've historically seen with a lot of policies that tend to, uh, they're all well-intentioned uh, and the reporting comes out, but those who have to carry out at the fundamental level, or as I'd like to say on the street, tend not to have a return beyond what they would normally expect uh, because they, they're taking what is perceived to be a higher risk uh, than uh, what, what we would normally look at in terms of here's the pattern or here's the profile. And so if we can get that bundle right, um, the, the reporting is will be keeping score. Uh, but at the end of the day, what, what um, as, a, as an entrepreneur, and I'm thinking generationally here, uh, I would prefer long-term to see behavioral change where the pattern now includes people who look like me or people who look like Jennifer, uh, as opposed to what tends to happen in practice. And this is not to denigrate the BC community, they're human. They're doing what we all do. We tend to look for collections of, of patterns and, and that's good and we'll go there. And so to the degree that we can uh, grow the success profile and that's gonna mean active engagement and ways to encourage and incent those who are in the private community to do things that they otherwise might not do. Thanks for that, Ken. Uh, I'm gonna take a question from the chat that's directed to Donna, um, but also try to combine it with another question that was sort of a jump ball. So uh, to Donna, how do you shift away the focus on VC among budding entrepreneurs? And if you were to pick to where, and, and there was another question in the chat about, I, I took from it, how do you, how do you widen the, the pool of would-be entrepreneurs? Um, and so, uh, Donna, I'd like to start with you for thoughts on that and anyone else, please feel free to jump in. Sure, so I'll take the latter and then the former. So, you know, the, the widening of the pool is an enormous problem. Um, what, even though entrepreneurship is in the media and gets glorified and we've got HBO series about it and it's sort of all over the news, millennials, younger generations are actually less inclined to be entrepreneurial than almost any generation before them, at least in recent history. Right? So we definitely have a pipeline problem of um, individuals not seeing entrepreneurship as a pathway. And there are a number of reasons for that, everything from are we teaching it in school? How, how is our curriculum structured? It's the sort of pipeline to college and the recruiting that happens in college that encourages people to choose sort of stable big business careers uh, as opposed to sort of presenting a both and, right? There's this sort of glorious range of possibilities that does also include entrepreneurship. Um, so we very much need as communities to have a strategic focus on how do we actually um, treat this like a career pathway in the same way that we treat other things and we uh, help to have people envision themselves in it. We tell the stories that aren't just the Zuckerbergs and um, a certain sort of genre of entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurship is every flavor from small business to, to Tesla. Um, so we, we have to do some storytelling. We have to think about our national imagination about how we talk about what entrepreneurship means because entrepreneurship we have defined as a verb and it is a particular kind of verb. It is a thing you do, you build a venture and oh, by the way, you build a venture that looks like this. It's big and it's scalable and it's a unicorn and it has an IPO. We should be talking about it as a verb and an adjective. It's a mindset, it's an approach and it's a thing you do, right? So we have a lot of work to do in terms of our culture and how we talk about entrepreneurship. And then when we think about what we're doing in community, we become very myopically focused on the financial leg of what should be a three-legged stool. Entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs need financial capital, they need social capital, and they need capacity building. And, and by the way, if you don't have all three of the legs of those stools, what happens is you tend to myopically focus on the financial leg. We don't have capital, therefore we can't build businesses. I have an idea, I need capital. Without capital, I can't grow my business. And Actually, there's a lot of gray area where you actually could get started on growing your business with less capital or even no capital if you had access to capacity building and access to the social capital, mentors and coaches and experts and people who can help you figure that out. But 
we, we sort of teach people that you have to go down this venture capital route. And so it become the formula that entrepreneurs go, I have an idea. Now I need to go raise money to go make that idea happen. And that's, a, that's actually a new concept in the world of entrepreneurship. If we go back to sort of the early Silicon Valley days, the guys in the garage and like hustling. Um, so we, we've, got to, we've got to sort of right this ship um, and put venture capital and capital raising in general in its right perspective. While we add the capital that communities need, we also need to be building the social, the, the networks and the opportunities for people of all flavors and demographics and ages and stripes and races to be, to be able to engage. And we've got to really take a hard look at how we're building the capacity of our entrepreneurs. We're not just teaching them to pitch and to be able to negotiate a term sheet. We have to teach them how they actually go out and take that idea and figure out if there's merit in that idea and how do they get scrappy to take that idea and begin to experiment and see if the market actually wants that idea. So um, it, it's, I think, all about writing the ship and making sure all three of those three legs of those stools are in place in a community and behooves all of us who are community leaders to put those things in place. Great. Anything to add on to that? Yeah, if, if I could real quick, Chris. So, sure. So I think that was very well stated. I agree with Donna. You have to have all those components. The challenge that we have seen over the years, though, in actually implementing that three-part comprehensive solution is that many times policymakers kind of think on this pendulum swing, and it's just one thing at a time. And then we find ourselves in this either-or type of situation, right? We're either going to do a venture capital initiative, or it's going to be some kind of alternative revenue-based financing model. And, and that just is not, it's just not a good path forward, because the reality is it has to be both and. There is no substitute for venture investing. It is an asset class that performs a certain function in the economy. And some types of startups simply cannot succeed without that type of capital infusion. There's a whole other range of companies that should never really even pursue venture capital. And so we all have to get better at kind of educating and promoting which direction to go on that startup path. But together, this community needs to help policymakers identify kind of when and how to support different types of businesses, because all those types of capital are needed. And my focus is on VC, and I promise you, there is a pervasive issue in most emerging ecosystems around the country where we do, in fact, need to build additional venture capital investing capability. But, but all of it as well, right? So that, that's the challenge I think we face. I want to get to one last question in the, uh, uh, and then turn to you all for sort of final thoughts. But um, just practical advice, and, and open this up um, um, to everybody. But what practical advice would you offer to small businesses or entrepreneurs who are looking to, um, you know, access state or federal assistance? Maybe Eric, I could s stick with you if I don't, you don't mind me putting you on the spot. Sure. So, so one thing is. Um, this whole field of technology-based economic development really has come a long way in the past 15 to 20 years. So there are so many more what's called venture development organizations in states and regions across the country than there were 10 to 15 years ago. I mean, just look at the explosion of accelerators and, and kind of the changes of business incubation and, and these small seed investment funds. These regions have come a long way. And so, you know, one piece of advice is make sure if you're an entrepreneur, that you are in fact reaching out to those venture development organizations in your region and state. Because many times, the ones who do this well, you don't even really know that they're supported by state government. Some of the most active early stage investors in probably eight to 10 states in the country are state-backed venture funds. But they do such a good job of integrating with the private sector and being private sector led that they are the ones doing the heavy lifting. So first and foremost is make sure you know who those organizations and people are and get involved in that. The second is, I do suggest that you proactively reach out to your state representatives, your congressional representatives, and, and just let them know what you're doing as a startup or entrepreneur and the specific needs and challenges you face, that not the government's gonna solve that problem for you, but when there is the right type of intervention, that you're a part of that conversation. I think that's really important to have local leaders engage in that kind of dialogue. 30 seconds on that from anybody else? Well, I'll support uh, exactly what Eric said. I think he's spot on uh, in that there are uh, resources available. One of the challenges among a number of certainly minority uh, entrepreneurs is lack of knowledge about those resources. And they just don't know they exist. Or if they do know, 
they don't know how to access it to at least be included because everything appears to be not for them, even though that's not the case. Uh, that's the appearance. And so people, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, will behave according to what they believe. And if they believe, well, there's no one there that's like me, so therefore I don't fit, so I should not even try. We do see a lot of that. Um, a piece of advice that I would certainly have for entrepreneurs or, or budding entrepreneurs, and I don't care what stripe you are, is the mindset of you're going to do it anyway, uh, and you're gonna do it quickly and at speed, regardless of what government may or may not do. Now that is a mindset. That doesn't mean you don't take advantage of opportunities that may be in various policy mechanisms. What it means is this mindset of we are going forward to get this done regardless. And what we have found is uh, people, individuals have come alongside us, not VCs, but individuals who have come alongside because they understand the vision, understand the purpose. And in fact, we just built those relationships if they weren't pre-existing. Uh, and that, that has allowed us to do what we've done today and will certainly fuel us for the future. Uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't do this for, from a policy standpoint, because I think there, again, there's some opportunities to enhance and incent individuals um, as well as organizations to get involved in this great enterprise that we call America, because we, we are the startup nation. I have great friends in Israel, uh, and they're called the startup nation, but we are the startup nation. Uh, and the challenge is, uh, if we don't have enough people who believe that that's true and that they have an opportunity to add value uh, to the great experiment that we call America, we stand to uh, become stagnant. And, and I think that's a problem long term for us, for our society. Uh, here, again, this is a beachhead in the sand and there's an opportunity for policies like this to actually begin to point out, uh, create awareness and mechanisms by which people can engage. That's great. I'm gonna to turn to Jennifer, Eric, and then let Donna close. But um, you know, there's a sense of urgency, I think we heard with Senator Klobuchar and her remarks. And just, uh, we all know how COVID has just exposed um, uh, so much and, and and real structural disparities that have existed for a long time. And, and I think she said there are neon lights right now. Um, if for anyone that didn't get it previously, it's, it's clear now. And so, um, I sense an urgency from all of you as well to, to really dive in. And so maybe just closing thoughts, beginning with Jennifer and then Eric, um, uh, 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 let us know your final thoughts. So I, I left the private sector to join the public sector to help solve this problem because I don't think the private sector is doing a good job. So I certainly applaud efforts like Senator Klobuchar's and the new Business Preservation Act. I think these programs are important and honestly, entrepreneurship to me is the place where we should put the most effort. You know, if you look at what entrepreneurs have been able to do during the pandemic to help solve the problems with getting additional PPE out to create, we had a battery company that shut off its manufacturing floor in order to make hand sanitizer to you know, provide to healthcare clinics and hospitals around New York State. So they, they pivot, they solve problems. Uh, and they make things happen quickly when when people need quick solutions, right? And and coming out of the pandemic, they're the ones who are going to grow the economy and build it back better. So that's where I'm put, putting my bet. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Eric. Yes. So my view is that you can believe in free market capitalism, as I think we all do, and also agree that kind of the natural course of markets is to concentrate and aggregate resources, and that we can try to make markets more efficient. And that's really what this is about. So, so I think Congress was right this year to focus primarily on how do you try to save mom and pop Main Street businesses that have just been crushed by this COVID pandemic. But when we start thinking about 2021 and beyond, we do need to be thinking about startups, equity finance, and Senator Klobuchar's bill will address that in a very positive market-based way. So great potential here. Um, innovation entrepreneurship can happen across America, and we need to support those ecosystems and their development. Eric, Donna? Yeah, I couldn't have said it better than Jennifer and, and Eric did. And this, isn't, this is not an either or moment. This is a both and moment. This is you know, Silicon Valley and everywhere, Democrat and Republican, high growth entrepreneur and small business, startups 
and to big businesses, the magnitude of the crisis means we don't have time to squabble over whether it's this or that. It's it's actually both. It's all these things, and we need a whole lot more of it happening in a whole lot more places. So, you know, it's not just about jobs. It's literally about the people who bring the kind of mindset and approach to solving problems in this moment that our country also needs. Because I also think that can also be a key to helping us come together and sort of solve some of what we think is dividing us. Because at the end of the day, we all actually want a prosperous country. And so it, it sounds a, sort of Americana and apple pie, but it actually is, right? The solution's there. We, we just need to grab a hold of these tools and, and put them to work. Thanks, Donna. Ken, want the last word? Well, I think I probably already gave it, but thank you. All right. Um, well, uh, I want to thank all of you for um, your, your thoughtful <laughs> observations and reflections. Um, uh, we really appreciate it here at EIG. Uh, I want to thank Catherine Lyons and Melitza Kosick from EIG for really pulling uh, this program together. Um, for folks who are on, I believe we'll send a recording out within the next several days. Uh, you can reach us at info at eig.org. If you want to reach any of the panelists and, and have trouble doing that, we're happy to connect um, or to field any questions we didn't get to. But um, on behalf of EIG, thank you all again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.